Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome our members and friends today uh, to this discussion with Dr. Scott Moore. Scott is the author of an exciting and fun uh, new book, China's Next Act, How Sustainability and Technology Are Reshaping China's Rise and the World's Future. Before introducing Scott, uh, please allow me to note that this discussion uh, is a live broadcast with our members and friends of uh, the U.S.-China Business Council. But our audience should know today that this broadcast will later be posted to YouTube uh, in the near future. So we would welcome uh, audience comments and questions uh, during the discussion uh, submitted through the Q&A function, which only Scott and I will see. I'll anonymize your comments or questions and then submit them uh, to Scott. And in this way, we hope to preserve the ambiance of um, a more or less private book launch, but also receive the benefits of a broader public program uh, on a set of in, uh, issues that really impacts all of us, and that is China's next act. Before that, however, uh, please allow me uh, to make a brief introduction of Dr. Scott Moore. Scott is the Director of China Programs and Strategic Initiatives in the Office of the Provost at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's a lecturer at Penn. Previously, Scott worked for the World Bank, and influencing this book greatly, uh, he worked also at the State Department's China Desk responsible for environment, science, health, and technology, what we diplomats call ESTH, um, uh, an important, uh, indeed vital, um, portfolio uh, within the State Department. Scott has published widely, including the New York Times, Nature, Foreign Affairs, and the Foreign Quarterly. China's next stack, the book that we're to discuss today, is Scott's second book following a previous work on water resources. His undergraduate degree is from Princeton. His doctorate is from Harvard. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and he received a Fulbright Scholarship and a, a Truman Scholarship. So, Scott, let's get going. Um, tell us about the book. Why did you write it? Craig, I wrote it because for foreign businesses, for universities, for governments, really anyone uh, involved in China's relationship with the world, the game has changed a lot in the last five to seven years. In fact, so much that in some ways uh, it looks unrecognizable. And the rules of this game, this new game uh, that we're all engaged in are quite different than they used to be. And I wrote the book because I wanted to try to help uh, those organizations and those entities understand what these new rules are what the game looks like and how they need to prepare themselves um, for the next few decades when it comes to China. And we'll get into all of this, but very briefly, I think there are two especially important ways in which the rules of, of this game have changed. One is that no matter what uh, arena or dimension of, of the uh, China relationship that you're in, whether you're uh, in industry, in services, uh, in the world of diplomacy, uh, increasingly, your business, your, uh, your job is being affected by developments in two areas, sustainability, and I include in that both public health as well as climate change and other environmental uh, uh, issues, and technology, uh, especially emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, big data, et cetera. So your job, your sector, your business is increasingly defined by issues in those two spaces. Uh, and then uh, it's also increasingly uh, affected by what we've come to call competition, uh, which is uh, another way of saying a kind of uh, 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 concept uh, of mostly uh, zero-sum thinking when it comes to China. In other words, uh, gains for uh, your side uh, mean losses for the other side and vice versa. So you've had this kind of shift both uh, topically, but also a big shift in terms of the uh, objective of uh, interaction with uh, Chinese counterparts. And both of those things have tremendous implications for uh, different actors, but I think 
uh, no uh, uh, entities more so than uh, foreign businesses. And that's why I'm particularly happy to have this opportunity uh, to share with you some thoughts and, uh, and get some, uh, some feedback. Well, that's excellent. Thank you. And I, I, I agree that for all of our companies, there's a lot here uh, in uh, this book. Now, um, let's start out uh, in the beginning. Um, uh, we all recall that Secretary Blinken described China's policy as a mix of competition, cooperation, and uh, possibly conflict. Um, you do, uh, I think, a really excellent job, the best I've seen, uh, of uh, introducing and really defining uh, the first two words, that is, cooperation and competition. They're different. Uh, and to get your thesis, we really need to understand that difference. So could, and it frames the rest of the book. Uh, uh, so could you help us here uh, uh, talking about competition and uh, cooperation? Well, I, I really appreciate that, that question, Greg. I, I do think it's really important, uh, not least because uh, in the kind of policy uh, arena, certainly uh, the, the word competition almost always follows the word China. Uh, and yet uh, no one ever pauses, at least that I've heard, uh, to really kind of take a, take a beat to think about what exactly that means. Uh, so I borrowed here from, from some academic work in, in an area called game theory that, that many folks may be, uh, may be familiar with in general terms, uh, and just sort of propose a definition for what we mean when we think about cooperation versus competition versus conflict, and then what that might mean for uh, actual interactions with uh, you know, Chinese customers, uh, uh, supply chain partners, et cetera. Um, and so briefly, uh, I, in my definition, cooperation refers to interaction or trade or exchange uh, that's conducted with the expectation uh, that that interaction will produce gains for both sides that are more or less equitable. Um, and that there's also kind of a piece to it that is this interaction is good for its own sake. It sort of produces, if you will indulge some, some jargon, positive externalities that, that accrue over time. Competition, on the other hand, means a type of interaction where you still are engaging in trade or exchange or communication with the idea of producing mutual benefit. In other words, both parties or both sides can gain. But the objective, your purpose, in engaging in that interaction is to ensure that your side gains more than the other side. So instead of expecting a relatively equitable distribution of gains, your uh, aim is to ensure that those gains are not equitable, um, that you gain more from that interaction. I think that's really what we mean when we talk about uh, competition uh, uh, with respect to, to China. Um, I will add just two other quick things, which uh, I, I talk about in the book and I think does do kind of flow through much of the rest of the book. Um, one of them is the idea that uh, part of the, the goal of competition, and I do lay out in the book how I think uh, this kind of uh, uh, framework of competition uh, can still be good, um, not just for uh, you know businesses or sort of individual actors, but also um, for the planet and for tackling shared global challenges, which is, of course, a lot of what the book is about. Um, but that being said, a key aim of, of competition and a key reason why I think it's better than, um, uh, than uh, some of the alternatives um, is that uh, it's about preventing conflict, which is the worst form of interaction. And that's really uh, a form of interaction where you're trying to ensure that the other side uh, doesn't gain at all. Um, and in fact, you're trying to uh, uh, destroy gains uh, uh, made by the other side. That's the most destructive form of, uh, of interaction. Uh, frankly, I think, you know, there's, there's growing concern that we're actually moving from thinking about competition as the framework toward conflict. But I would underscore that part of why, uh, part of effective competition is preventing conflict. The other thing I will say, though, up front, is I think it's equally true that cooperation is almost always cheaper uh, and uh, less complicated than competition. Um, so it's almost always the case that if you were starting from a blank sheet of paper, you would probably prefer cooperation. Um, but there are lots of practical reasons why I think we are operating in this, this framework that looks more like competition. 
So uh, to me as a practitioner, this is a really helpful dichotomy uh, because we want to move issues out of the conflict bucket into the competitive bucket and out of the competitive bucket and into the cooperation bucket uh, to the extent possible and uh, be able to uh, uh, both gain uh, in terms of cooperation. So I find that uh, uh, actually insightful and profoundly helpful uh, in our advocacy uh, for uh, increasing cooperation uh, between the two sides. Let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, in your introductory chap uh, chapter, you this is provocatively title, entitled, The End of Growth uh, and the Return of Ideology. Uh, and in this, you discuss incentive systems uh, within the, I think the Communist Party more than the government, but both. Uh, Really, and I found this really interesting. You you bring a political scientist's eye to uh, and explain some things that I've seen for decades, but never really understood. Uh, could you talk about uh, the free agent approach to governance? What are the costs and what are the benefits and how does that distinguish uh, China? Yeah, well, and I should say, uh, Craig, that, uh, that this kind of uh, uh, scene setter that, that you mentioned uh, basically tries to um, you know, in uh, in 30 pages or so, I uh, try to pro provide a pretty, uh, pretty general overview of where China is headed both politically and uh, economically, because I do think that's essential to then thinking about or the understanding that's essential to then thinking about how uh, emerging technologies or how climate risk or how uh, public health uh, is going to uh, uh, to play out. Uh, in both uh, China uh, in particular and, and in terms of its role in the world. So it's uh, very much kind of an attempt to, to set the scene for, uh, for that discussion. And one of the things that I think is really important to, uh, to appreciate about uh, China, both generally and with respect to how China um, approaches environmental challenges, public health challenges, even uh, technology development, um, is just how uh, diffuse and in many ways decentralized um, the system is. Now, um, there are uh, kind of have to hasten to add um, that uh, uh, decision making um, is uh, heavily concentrated uh, in China. Um, uh, there's very little kind of political decentralization in, in political science speak, but there's a tremendous amount uh, both of economic uh, and of uh, practical or uh, administrative decentralization, which is another way of saying um, that there's a tremendous amount of autonomy and freedom given to lower level officials, state owned enterprise officials, other uh, key actors uh, in China's political and economic system um, to meet goals that are set at the top. So as long as you're kind of broadly pursuing goals that are set um, at the top, there's a tremendous amount of practical uh, freedom and autonomy given to actors kind of lower, um, uh, lower down in the system, so to speak. Um, one of the consequences of that, though, um, is you have a kind of problem for the central decision makers of how to make sure that they're actually that these all these sort of uh, 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 free agents um, are actually pursuing the goals that you have set and not their own goals. Um, and in fact, you see that kind of um, that play out uh, in areas like environmental protection, um, where there's a tremendous amount of um, you know, sort of paying lip service to uh, environmental performance targets, but when push comes to shove, um, you know, it's really more about local economic uh, uh, self-interest, for example. So that kind of principal agent problem um, in academic speak is often something that you see, um, it's a key dynamic in a lot of China-related um, kind of policy issues. Um, and, and one thing just to, to add on to that, um, that I think is important to recognize is that actually does hold true even when you look at like technology development, intellectual property protection, that sort of gap between uh, the central high level decision making and the practical implementation. Uh, you see a tremendous gap there um, and there's a lot of local variation um, in how even uh, strategic national priorities are kind of played out at the local level. It never ceases to amaze me um, how, you know, uh, that kind of doesn't necessarily uh, figure into uh, uh, into discussions overseas. I think that that's really helpful and it explains a lot of phenomenon uh, that we see when dealing with a mayor or a governor or a, a vice minister. 
Now, you quote Ben Harburg, uh, managing partner at MSA Capital, saying that emerging markets is where the real battleground lies. And that is where Chinese companies uh, can uh, uh, prove themselves. Uh, and I think that we're really seeing that uh, your prediction or your, your observation more and more true over time as a Shanghai uh, cooperation uh, organization expands and as China and Russia focus on the global south. Uh, but um, how attractive are Chinese companies in the global south? Is this a, is this a viable strategy? Um, yes, but it's not an optimal one. Um, and to say a little bit more about that, I think, um, I think you know, and obviously it depends uh, uh, widely uh, on, uh, on sort of sector by sector, technology by technology. But I think for the most part, yes, Chinese firms are uh, often quite attractive uh, to emerging markets um, and are, are often very competitive players in emerging markets. The challenge uh, is that those emerging markets uh, have much higher political, economic, and other forms of risk attached to them than uh, developed markets in, in many cases. Um, and the, the fact that the kind of locus of, or focus of attention uh, from uh, China's uh, business community is shifting toward those markets is not necessarily out of choice. Um, it's at least in part a response to uh, growing uh, political uh, tensions and, and uh, uh, increasingly stringent regulations, uh, uh, scrutiny of Chinese investment uh, across a big swath of the, the developed world. Um, and that means that to some extent, um, this, uh, this focus and this move is more a response to uh, being, uh, you know, to, to facing uh, greater barriers uh, to, uh, to expanding in uh, developed markets. Um, so it's not necessarily a trend or a phenomenon that's, um, that's a first choice or optimal uh, strategy. Um, the other thing that, of course, has to be said is given, given our kind of macroeconomic weather here, uh, emerging markets are, are, are in for a tough ride. Um, and so that kind of bet um, or that, that direction is going to be uh, a rockier and more complicated one than it looked like uh, two or three years ago. No, I, I, I think that that's uh, very well said. Thank you. Um, now, the bulk of your book is... Uh, walking uh, the four corners of ESTH, uh, but you put public health uh, first. Uh, and I thought that that was interesting. Was that because of COVID or, uh, I, th I think you have actually much more profound uh, reasons for that, but uh, I'm grateful uh, to know why you prioritize the health part of ESTH. Yeah, well, it's it's a great question, uh, Craig, and there there is both a, a kind of shallow and a deep reason. Uh, I have to say, when I was uh, writing the book, and one of the challenges of writing, you know, an, a, a university press book about uh, China is that by the time it's out, you know, it's uh, the world has moved on, uh, and certainly China has moved on. Uh, but when I was writing it, the pandemic was certainly front and center. But there is a, a deeper reason, um, uh, which makes me still glad I, I put public health first. And that's because I think uh, it is the area in, uh, that makes clearest the fundamental kind of uh, dilemma um, that I, I try to wrestle with in the book. And that's that China is indispensable to tackling shared global challenges, whether they're in the field of public health or uh, climate change or anywhere else. Um, and yet uh, that the kind of even as uh, uh, these kind of shared challenges have become more a, a bigger and more important part of China's relationship in the world, if anything, they've actually uh, made relations worse uh, with the rest of the world. And if anything, the kind of shift in focus to these shared global challenges, uh, and as these global challenges have become more intense, uh, if anything, that's, uh, that's actually uh, uh, bolstered rivalry and, and competition rather than uh, kind of strengthened cooperation. And I think public health is a great uh, illustration of that for the following reason. Uh, COVID-19, uh, or the more specifically the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2, um, as the name implies, is the second novel coronavirus to originate in southern China, at least as far as we know, um, in less than 20 years. Um, that's a pretty stunning fact that I, I think it's actually remarkable that it, it doesn't sort of get more uh, attention. And if you sort of widen the, the uh, aperture still further and you look at uh, uh, emerging uh, diseases more generally. Uh, there are uh, quite a few other uh, uh, 
uh, viruses that, uh, at least as far as we know, may well have originated um, in southern China uh, just in the in the 21st century, including uh, uh, avian influenza, certain strains of avian influenza. Now, that's not because China is somehow a unique, um, you know, kind of incubator uh, of these things. It's because uh, Ch South China, in particular, combines a couple of uh, geographic, uh, climactic, ecological uh, factors with being exceptionally well connected to the rest of the world. So there is a, this kind of concept uh, called uh, pandemic hotspots. And basically the idea here is that there are certain parts of the world that again, for this kind of combination of geography, ecology, um, uh, uh, climate are uh, uniquely kind of uh, susceptible to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, kind of originating um, new, uh, new viruses. Um, but of those, and other examples of that include uh, uh, parts of South Asia, Equatorial Africa, um, Southern China really stands out because of how well connected it is to the rest of the world. Um, and you see that in the initial spread of uh, particularly SARS-CoV-2, the, um, uh, the SARS virus in the early 2000s, but also with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it doesn't take long before something that, that happens in South China um, spreads around the world because of how well connected um, it is. And to me, that is the single clearest example uh, of how uh, the world uh, does need China to provide, to tackle uh, shared global challenges or to provide global public goods. Um, and yet, you know, again, unfortunately, if we kind of look at the, the course of, of these, uh, these epidemics and pandemics, um, it's, if anything, uh, deepened uh, uh, divisions between China and other countries. So it's this real kind of paradox and dilemma, but I think public health is the clearest example of why we nonetheless have to resolve um, this dilemma and how uh, we need uh, cooperation with China um, uh, on these shared global challenges. So you you, you note in the book, uh, I, and I think write quite beautifully about the hundred years or more of uh, uh, healthcare and medical collaboration be and, and cooperation between uh, China and the United States, going back uh, well into the Qing dynasty and, and before. And yet, uh, when I look at the situation today, I see conflict. Uh, and indeed, for the medical device and ph pharma companies uh, and health, uh, health life sciences companies that we have, uh, things are not easy uh in in the china market now so um any thoughts on how we might continue with the that that long and i would say glorious uh tradition of healthcare uh public health uh cooperation any thoughts on how we could get back uh to a more collaborative uh stance a, a few um but i should say maybe first uh first of all craig that um one of the kind of themes of the book is you know we think about uh just intuitively just sort of off the cuff think about uh issues like preventing the next pandemic or or fighting climate change as things that are fundamentally about cooperation we need uh kind of a almost like an altruistic uh you know kind of philosophy to uh uh to uh make progress on these on these shared challenges it's sort of an almost al not to belittle uh belittle it but it's sort of an al almost like a can't we all just get along kind of uh, uh, uh kind of um, uh, implication um there uh, but one of the things that i talk about in the book is that in practice um the response to these shared global challenges um, especially by governments and especially the u.s and chinese governments over time uh, have always been really shaped by uh, geopolitical uh, concerns and dynamics, which is another way of saying that, um, historically speaking, there has never been a very sharp distinction or black and white uh, kind of difference between um, action on shared global challenges and uh, politics, tension, rivalry. Um, the two have always coexisted, uh, and there have been times, and I, uh, this is another reason why I thought it was uh, important to start with public health, um, there have been uh, some good examples of how uh, countries, including the U.S. and China, have been able to work together uh, on in areas like public health, even while uh, competing and, and sort of engaging in rivalry in other areas. Um, there's no kind of sharp distinction um, between the two. That being said, in response to your kind of particular question, um, I think that there 
Uh, and unfortunately, at the sort of uh, government to government level, a lot of practical challenges uh, to this uh, to this space. And I think one um, uh, one approach is to uh, rely more heavily on uh, non governmental uh, uh, actors, and that's another big theme of the book. And uh, certainly, the private sector comes in really uh, as a really uh, really important in this uh, in this space. But I think. Uh, as difficult as it is to engage in discussions about uh, about things like public health, um, there is still much more space for universities, for research laboratories and institutions uh, to lead that discussion uh, as opposed to governments. Uh, no, I think that that's where we are. You sum it up uh, very well. Uh, I liked your, your comments on Ebola, by the way. I thought that uh, that's a great example of government to government uh, cooperation. But let's move on. Um, the second functional area that you discuss is environment. And I must say, it's a fascinating chapter. Um, you discuss uh, China-US dynamics through three sets of uh, uh, climate, uh, global climate negotiations, Copenhagen, Paris, and Glasgow. And indeed, you were a participant uh, in, in them. So I wonder if you could share the patterns and uh, what, what does that uh, uh, teach you about uh, upcoming uh, climate uh, cooperation? Um, I think, first of all, I would say that climate change is really the first kind of global um, governance issue uh, in which uh, Beijing decided to make uh, a serious play to be uh, 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 a, a leading actor. Um, and that was really going back to uh, the early 2010s. Since then, uh, we've seen other kind of domains in which uh, Beijing has attempted to, to play that role, including in, in uh, global health, uh, including in uh, development, international development with the Belt and Road. So there have been others, uh, but climate change was the first. Um, uh, and I think it was uh, the first uh, for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, one, and this is something I talk quite a bit in the book that I, I don't think um, gets, uh, gets enough, uh, enough attention in the outside world, um, but it's just how heavily exposed China itself is to climate risk. Um, and in fact, uh, I came to believe, you know, admittedly, this is debatable, uh, but I came to believe that of the world's big countries and big economies, uh, China may be the most exposed uh, to climate risk. So I think there's very much a, you know, kind of self-interest uh, part of the equation there, which is certainly not bad. Um, but uh, another kind of uh, uh, piece of that dynamic um, was, uh, I think, Beijing, uh, and, and in part because of the sheer size of China's emissions, um, saw the opportunity to kind of um, be a co-equal partner of the United States uh, in tackling uh, this, this shared kind of global governance uh, challenge. Uh, and one of the things that has shifted in the last uh, decade or so is that uh, going back to when I was uh, somewhat involved in this, the Paris uh, Agreement negotiations, um, that was fine. From a, an American perspective, uh, sort of happy to share the, uh, the, the pedestal, so to speak. Um, now it's not. Uh, now, again, there is this sort of zero sum uh, mentality that's, uh, uh, or kind of a, a framework of competition um, that now shapes uh, how we think about climate change as much as uh, political military issues or, or trade and investment. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, what's not changed, the sort of through line, uh, is China's interest uh, and willingness to, to be a, 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 a key player and in some ways a leader in this issue area. What has changed uh, is, I think, the response of other countries, uh, most notably the United States, uh, to that. Uh, I thought um, that uh, in the environmental chapter, you could toggle uh, between cooperation and competition, uh, perhaps uh, to the benefit, both to the benefit of, of uh, global public goods uh, very well. I, I really like the way that you uh, express that in, in the book. Perhaps you could discuss that uh, a little bit more on how both uh, how competition in the climate area could benefit uh, carbon reduction. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, uh, and I should say too, you know, I, uh, the kind of uh, one of the, the sort of uh, main, main uh, uh, themes of the book is this idea that we, we do have to think about how to make progress on shared global challenges through competition as well as cooperation. Um, but in doing that, in sort of making that argument, 
Uh, I do also talk a lot about areas where I think there is some potential um, for cooperation as well, and several of them are in the environmental arena. Um, but having said that, on climate change, I think there are two areas where this idea of competition, both economic and geopolitical, can be good for the planet. And the first of those is in clean energy development. Um, the, what we've kind of seen in, in, in no small part because of China um, is uh, that renewable uh, energy, and in particular wind and solar power, has scaled faster than anybody uh, thought possible uh, a few years ago. And in fact, it's as far as we can tell, it's scaled faster than any technology in the history of humanity. Um, that's great news. Um, it's still not enough. Uh, to decarbonize the world economy by the end of this century, um, which is where we need to get and, and actually we probably need to do it even sooner. Um, what we need to do that uh, is a whole new generation of clean technology. Um, some of it is better, more efficient solar, um, but some of it and wind and other renewables, but some of it's fundamentally different technology uh, like green hydrogen. Um, and those types of technologies are things that are gonna require a lot more investment uh, in research development and commercialization, uh, including by governments. Uh, and I think to the extent that this idea of competition that Craig, as you pointed out, uh, is kind of shared in, in a lot of places now, including in uh, Beijing, as well as Washington and, and Brussels and other places, um, that can be a, a powerful motivator uh, of mobilizing support for more government investment in uh, clean uh, technology and clean energy development. The best example of that, I think, is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is uh, a lot of folks know uh, represents by far the largest single investment uh, the U.S. has ever made in uh, clean energy and clean technology. Uh, and if you look at President Biden's uh, message to Congress uh, urging them to pass it, uh, he actually referred to the need for the U.S. to compete with China more effectively. To the extent that that idea of competition leads to more investment in clean energy and clean technology, it can be good um, for the planet. Uh, the challenge, of course, is making sure that that competition is virtuous uh, and not destructive, um, which, frankly, there is a risk of. Uh, indeed, uh, this has become pretty controversial along with everything else. Let's, let's move on um, to your chapter on talent. Uh, and as a professor at Penn, uh, you're uh, in the middle of uh, this flow. Um, and you note that there's been re some really significant changes recently. What patterns are you seeing? And are you seeing, uh, and what is the stay rate? And why is that important? Well, you know, I mentioned that uh, a lot of my purpose in writing the book was to just think through um, what it means to uh, for China to be indispensable in tackling these shared global challenges or providing these global public goods um, at the same time that we seem to be losing uh, trust and the ability to, uh, to work together across a whole swath of, of areas. Um, and in thinking through that problem, it occurred to me that uh, Probably China's single greatest contribution to global public goods, at least in the modern era, uh, has been to knowledge production and cultural exchange, simply because of the numbers of Chinese students, scholars, uh, expatriate workers, uh, et cetera, um, that have lived and studied abroad, especially uh, in the West and most particularly in the United States. Uh, and in every uh, uh, major university, college university of any size in the United States, you will see significant numbers uh, of Chinese students and scholars. Uh, and while those communities look very different, uh, one thing you can say uh, with certainty uh, is that they play uh, an enormously important role uh, in the intellectual life and the research enterprise uh, and in the, the cultural uh, uh, flourishing of those institutions and those universities. Um, that's true at Penn, that's true everywhere that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, we have seen some concerning uh, trends in light of that importance um, in recent years. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that Penn is a little bit of an exception. Our, our numbers have been going, uh, continue to go up, um, but nationwide, um, they, they continue to go down uh, since the pandemic. Uh, we'll have the latest uh, figures in a couple weeks for um, sort of through this, uh, this academic year, which will give, uh, I think, a better sign uh, kind of uh, as we, we continue to transition away from the sort of full-on pandemic um, phase of things. 
But what we've been seeing is decreasing uh, enrollment, decreasing uh, application numbers, uh, and a falling stay rate, which means uh, the percentage of uh, students who stay in the United States after completing uh, their course of study, uh, especially on a, a visa category or a, a visa uh, a policy called uh, OPT, optional practical training. Um, so what we've seen is that rate uh, has decreased. Uh, and the implication for uh, the United States uh, is that we're losing a tremendous amount of talent. Yeah, thank you, uh, Scott. Uh, one of the uh, delights of the book is uh, that you introduce a good number of quite colorful characters, some of whom I had heard about uh, and some of them that I had not, uh, but always uh, instructive uh, 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 in your making a point. So could you tell us about Ray Davis? Why is he important? Yeah, well, Ray Davis uh, is a, an American um, uh, biochemist uh, and, uh, and researcher and entrepreneur. Uh, and the reason he figures into the story um, is that uh, he uh, uh, decided to, uh, uh, to leave a, a very uh, kind of cushy position um, at a university in California uh, for uh, a post in China, at least part time. And, and I use this story to make the point um, that and this actually is is also related to your previous uh, question about the investments that uh, China has made in its uh, science, technology, innovation uh, capacity, uh, and the, the the gap between uh, China's capabilities in that area uh, and those of the United States, other advanced economies, uh, is uh, is shrinking. Uh, and by the way, one implication I think for uh, foreign businesses of a lot of these kind of trends and currents. Um, we've been talking about with, with regard to talent uh, is that China uh, is uh, an increasingly isolated, but still very important and dynamic innovation ecosystem. As we lose or as the kind of volumes of, of students and scholars um, uh, coming to places like the United States shrinks, there will be an increasing challenge for foreign enterprises about how to tap into those talent networks. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that we have great uh, answers for that, but I think it'll be an increasing challenge uh, as some of these linkages that we've relied on to basically plug in uh, science, research, innovation uh, in China versus other, uh, uh, other countries shrink. Um, so Ray Davis was sort of an example of um, that uh, uh, waxing, uh, and the challenge now is how to deal with it waning. Uh, I love the way that you uh, put that, Scott. Uh, China is uh, a somewhat uh, distant but highly uh, dynamic uh, innovation uh, ecosystem that is evolving separate uh, oftentimes from the rest of the world. But it will be attractive to many Ray Davises. And, uh, and that is an interesting development, uh, to say the least. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper on this. Um, you spoke about the Thousand Talents campaign, which I think probably everyone here will know about. But you noted uh, that uh, the problem that the Chinese uh, are facing is absorptive capacity. And I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about that uh, a little bit more. Sure. Well, and this kind of this concept comes in in sort of the, the vein of a, of a broader discussion uh, of some of what I think are the uh, systematic weaknesses of uh, uh, China's uh, science, technology, innovation ecosystem. Um, uh, that ecosystem does have advantages, by the way, but I think uh, it also has some significant weaknesses. Um, and one of those uh, fundamental weaknesses is uh, in this area of absorb, uh, absorptive capacity, uh, which refers to the ability of uh, particularly firms uh, and companies to make good use of innovations or technologies that they're able to uh, uh, acquire or adopt, whether that's through you know some form of direct technology transfer or uh, internal uh, innovation. Um, the ability of a firm to sort of take a new idea or an improvement and make good use of it and turn it into profit or productivity, um, that's really what we, what we mean when we talk about uh, absorptive capacity. Um, and that is a, a, a metric on which Chinese firms have historically underperformed. Um, the kind of 
magnitude of that underperformance uh, has been decreasing over time. Uh, and certainly it looks very different in you know, state-owned versus non-state-owned uh, and sector by sector. Uh, but in general, that's a, a, a metric uh, where Chinese firms have historically underperformed. And if China is to uh, continue to grow, um, especially to grow at kind of more than uh, you know, 1% uh, per year, uh, that metric is going to have to shoot up. Um, and when you hear uh, uh, people like uh, Xi Jinping talk about innovation and making China uh, an innovation economy, that's a key metric uh, for what that means. I think it's uh, uh, very uh, interesting. So on chapter five on technology, which follows on beautifully from talent, I, I have to say, um, you note that, uh, quote, it wasn't so much that the United States began to fall behind as that China began to catch up, end quote. And I think that that's just so well put. Uh, uh, can you discuss? Yeah, and this kind of gets back to um, a lot of these comparative metrics. And and I mean, as a sort of method point, um, it's hard to capture or measure something like innovation. Um, but nonetheless, people try. Um, and I, uh, I try to go through a lot of different uh, metrics for, uh, for that uh, uh, sort of innovativeness um, uh, 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 measure. Um, and basically what all of those show um, is that while the gap has been shrinking between advanced uh, economies, in particular the United States and China, um, the gap still exists. And if you kind of want to think of it like a, like a curve, um, the curve kind of looks like this, where you're narrowing the gap, but there's still a gap and you sort of start to see signs of, uh, uh, of, of plateauing, um, which kind of leads to the conclusion that there probably will be a gap for the foreseeable future, um, absent some pretty uh, uh, fundamental reform, uh, again, in areas like uh, absorptive capacity, um, some other things uh, I talk about are you know, intellectual property protections, the incentives uh, for uh, researchers to sort of crowd into um, uh, uh, topics or areas that are uh, centrally directed as opposed to the ones that show the most promise technologically or commercially. Um, so there are a lot of kind of uh, systemic issues that would have to be resolved um, for that to really uh, for that to really change. But across the board, uh, one of the big picture takeaways is that the gap is narrowing, uh, but it's still there and probably will continue to be there for some time. Yeah, Scott, uh, I, I liked your um, comments on the Chinese science and technology establishment, how it's not as productive as it could be or it should be. And uh, I just thought that you had some real good insights there. Uh, I wonder if, if you could share about interdisciplinary um, uh, uh, lack of linkages uh, that we see in Chinese universities and academic institutions. Yeah, well, and again, one of the sort of headline things uh, is the the sort of uh, uh, Chinese state approach to innovation is uh, it, it's one that can get results, and you know we see that in in uh, uh, in plenty of arenas. But it it does to in, artificial intelligence is probably the best example of that. Um, but it is a pretty inefficient one in that the value that you get for an infusion of, of resources uh, tends, to be, uh, tends to be pretty low. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, including the ones that you, uh, that you alluded to, uh, Craig, where uh, you tend to see a lot of um, uh, uh, people pursuing research in uh, one discipline or another, like one silo, um, as opposed to pursuing uh, uh, research that sort of sits at the intersection of different disciplines, and that tends to be um, a riskier approach, uh, but one that can pay big dividends. And one I talk about in the book is the uh, intersection of artificial intelligence and biotechnology, for example, being a really, really rich and fruitful uh, area, both for commercial and other applications. Um, but that involves two different fields having to talk to each other and develop joint proposals. And for a number of reasons, there are some disincentives um, in the Chinese uh, academic and research system uh, to doing that. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's really useful. So thank you uh, for that. 
Um, one of the other very interesting characters that you raised, who I've heard about for many years, but I really didn't know anything about him, was uh, Marshal Nye Rungchun. Uh, can you describe his advocacy on self-reliance and uh, the influence uh, that uh, Marshal Nye uh, has on s and thinking today? I thought that that was really helpful. Yeah, and you know, I I uh, also wasn't very familiar with uh, Nia before uh, starting the research on this book, but he emerged as a, a really pretty important figure, and you know, I, I would sort of make a make a nomination for him as one of the um, uh, the most important, least known uh, figures in uh, in the early history of the People's Republic. Um, so Nia was a, a high ranking. Uh, a, uh, officer in, in the People's Liberation Army, um, uh, was a, a decorated uh, field commander. Uh, but then in the in the immediate post-war or post-1949 period, uh, was basically made uh, a kind of national supply and mobilization czar uh, in charge of uh, making possible China's intervention in the Korean War. Um, and in doing that, in trying to marshal uh, the resources of what was, you know, frankly, a pretty devastated country after uh, decades of civil war and uh, uh, and the Japanese uh, invasion uh, during the Second World War. Uh, uh, it was, that was a monumental task, um, and one of the the one of Nia's kind of basic uh, uh, approaches there, which he borrowed uh, from some of his Soviet uh, mentors and uh, uh, and counterparts at the time, um, was to think. Uh, of, uh, of military needs, civilian needs, state needs, not as separate, um, but as kind of one and the same, and to try to find where possible synergies or efficiencies between these things. Um, and without, you know, overly simplifying uh, uh, 30, 40 years of, of subsequent history, uh, in that idea, uh, you can actually see the kind of uh, antecedents of what people now talk about as uh, uh, civil military fusion, uh, or the idea that there's no line as there typically is in the West between uh, resources or, or uh, research uh, in military technology versus civilian uh, uh, technology. The other aspect of what uh, of your question that's important and where Nia played a really important role um, is uh, putting forward something called the task-oriented approach to uh, research and, and innovation and, uh, and resource mobilization. And that's the idea, and it sort of follows from, you know, central planning uh, 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 of the economy, is the idea that the state sets the priorities, and then everybody sort of down the chain, whether you're a, a scientist or a, a, a lab manager, uh, you're uh, going to respond to those to that set of priorities. Funding uh, is uh, directly tied to uh, that set of centrally uh, oriented uh, priorities. And that's actually uh, uh, very different from uh, the model that uh, exists uh, in the United States and some other Western countries in which um, there's much less of an explicit uh, central priority list that all resource requests must speak to and much more discretion given to individual researchers um, or, uh, uh, or practitioners to decide what they think the most important uh, things are. Um, that may sound like a subtle distinction, but it's really, really important because it basically inverts who decides um, what the most fruitful and important areas of research or investment are. Um, and candidly, the record of the kind of state-led approach uh, is, not, uh, uh, is not particularly flattering. I uh, could not agree with you more uh, in China, Japan, or any other country uh, as, uh, as well. You discuss uh, translational research. And for lay persons like myself, I, I kind of think I know what that means, but I'm not, not really sure. Uh, could you uh, help us out? Yeah, uh, so this is another one of those sort of concepts and, and approaches, really, um, that is, uh, you know, sort of sounds uh, uh, either simple or, uh, or, or maybe sort of obvious, um, but is really, really important. And translational research uh, refers to, to doing research uh, in two uh, especially important ways. One, uh, it uh, is done with the idea of borrowing insights and methods from different disciplines. So again, you're sort of trying to break down uh, these silos, but also doing that with an eye toward practical application. 
not necessarily commercial applications. And actually, uh, the translational research was basically um, a concept that came out of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, um, in which the driving uh, uh, objective is, is more and better treatment um, for medical uh, issues and ailments. So the applications don't necessarily have to be commercial in nature. They can be uh, palliative, you know, they can be uh, medical. Uh, but the idea is you're, you're trying to um, solve problems by breaking down disciplinary silos, but you're doing that with the aim of, of identifying uh, some concrete applications. Um, so you're basically trying to play two, you know, kind of multi-level chess there um, with, with research. And it's a really, really um, uh, rich and fruitful approach. Um, and incidentally, again, you know, kind of coming, having come out of uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health, it's a it's an approach in which the U.S. has historically led. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, would you call prototyping uh, a, a type of translational research? It can be. Um, I think the the kind of key uh, distinction of whether or not something would kind of fit into the translational research category um, is, again, whether um, you're really uh, uh, trying to, uh, to be interdisciplinary. Um, and one of, the, one of the kind of ways that, that institutions uh, uh, try to implement translational research, by the way, um, is embedding researchers from different uh, specialties in each other's labs um, or research groups uh, as a way of trying to cross-fertilize. Um, so prototyping certainly can be uh, done in a way that that it is sort of translational research uh, uh, framework, um, just depending on how you how you're sort of trying to implement it. Got it. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, uh, let's talk about data. Your chapter on data uh, is uh, great. Um, and you um, note uh, that uh, the Chinese um, government and Chinese companies have been very active uh, in standards making, particularly within the ITU. Um, and can you describe the impact of that? Uh, and uh, and perhaps we could just know uh, that things have changed a little bit in the ITU. They have, uh, as yes, you're, you're absolutely right to point that out, uh, Craig. And again, one of the challenges of, uh, uh, of the timelines of uh, publishing a book about China. Um, <laughs> you do often have to do some uh, place and catch up. Um, I think what I would just sort of start by pointing out though um, uh, is data is one of the areas in which I think um, it's very clear that the rules of the game have changed, um, particularly for foreign uh, uh, companies. And one thing I talk a lot about in that chapter is the rise of uh, data protectionism and, and sort of a, a uh, a framework of, of what some people call uh, cyber sovereignty uh, in China. Uh, and this will be very familiar to, uh, to firms when it comes to provisions like data localization um, uh, that's been, uh, been strengthened through recent legislation. And what we're kind of getting at here uh, is the creation of different uh, data spheres for the Chinese market, the American market, the European market, uh, et cetera. Um, that obviously creates a lot of practical costs and challenges uh, for companies. Uh, and the, uh, the challenge of being able to export or really even tap uh, data, uh, even from a company's own operations uh, within China, uh, is increasingly uh, uh, looking, looking uh, 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 cloudy. Um, so trying to, to tackle those uh, protectionist instincts in an area like data is increasingly uh, important. Um, your question, though, gets to uh, one of the reasons why I think the, the realm of data has also become so colored by geopolitics, um, and that is uh, that prob probably more clearly than in any other area, you've seen a concerted uh, effort by uh, Beijing to uh, exert greater influence in multilateral bodies in a way that directly benefits Chinese companies. Uh, and so in particular, I talk about how uh, the ITU um, during a period in which a, a Chinese national was uh, the director general in which uh, Chinese nationals did hold um, sig uh, other significant positions in the organization, uh, adopted a, uh, a key kind of protocol for 5G technology uh, in, in an area in which uh, Huawei happened to own uh, many of the significant patents. Um, so it's a, as clear an example as I think you'll find of where um, there's sort of a, 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 an effort by the state 
uh, to, uh, to directly advantage Chinese firms. Um, I have to say, you know, China is not unique in world history. Other, uh, you know, other countries have done similar things, um, but it's, a, it, it's an example and a reason of why these sort of competitive dynamics, geopolitics, political risk, um, have increasingly come to color uh, so many parts of the of the tech uh, the tech domain as well. Yeah, Scott, there's there's so much that we could discuss here. This is so very rich. Um, but um, you you note in the book that uh, quote there is a little doubt that gray zone information theft is a problem, and I'm sure Chinese companies steal from Chinese companies <laughs> over the internet as well. <laughs> um, uh, what is not clear is that the costs of open data and information sharing outweigh the benefits. And I think that that's a, something that we re all really need to reflect on. Uh, where do we draw the balance here? And uh, so I just wanted to compliment you on, on uh, noting uh, the value of, uh, of open data, but also recognizing the real dangers there. Um, I think that where data is becoming less and less open as companies become more and more cautious. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it is a it is a big challenge, not just uh, you know kind of commercially and for businesses about how you uh, aggregate and, and export and really make use of data from different markets, but you know you're also thinking about totally different regulatory uh, frameworks you have to deal with. Um, and then if you translate it over into kind of the research and academic sphere, it's, it's equally, if not more concerning um, that there are both legal and just, you know, practical day-to-day -day, uh, barriers to sharing uh, data. And, you know, that's, that's becoming a big problem in areas like pharma and drug development, where uh, there was a period in which uh, it seemed like it was a win-win to conduct clinical trials uh, in places like China and then use them to, uh, to seek approval in the U.S. and other uh, markets. Um, but for a variety of reasons, uh, data protectionism is one. Um, that is probably not going uh, to produce the gains that, uh, uh, that were expected just a few years ago. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of loss from that, both commercial uh, and other I, I could not agree, agree with you more. Maybe Scott, to close out here, as we're approaching the, the top of the hour, um, in your conclusion, you state that China's rise may still be disruptive, but it need not be destructive. And I think that that is really prescient uh, there. Um, your thoughts on how to advise uh, President Biden on how the the fact that we're going to have to accept that it's disruptive, but uh, not uh, how to ensure that it's not destructive. I uh, I would be grateful for your, for any closing thoughts. Well, I think part of it is this idea of trying to make gains for the planet uh, through competition as well as through cooperation. But at the same time, I think it's important to keep uh, an eye on the prize, um, which I believe deeply, and and really, it's the ultimately the point of the book, uh, is uh, sustainability and technology. These are the two uh, issue areas that are going to shape uh, the rest of this century, no matter what sector or business uh, you're in. Uh, those areas are, are, are the prize, so to speak. Uh, and everything, every kind of strategy or approach has to flow uh, from that. Uh, and if I, uh, I might, Craig, just sort of end with a couple of uh, uh, reflections that that I uh, or things that I came to believe are, are are particularly true for companies operating in this um, in this arena. Uh, I think the idea of dealing with different data spheres uh, is one dealing with this fragmentation uh, of data, uh, dealing with a, an increasingly isolated Chinese innovation ecosystem uh, is another, and just how to tap and leverage talent uh, within that. Um, another thing that I think uh, is increasingly uh, 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 important uh, is thinking about how to uh, embed environmental sustainability more deeply, not just in direct China operations, uh, but throughout supply chains and partner relationships. Um, and I think that's uh, an issue that you see uh, becoming increasingly salient, not just uh, 
for regulatory reasons and you know, China's decarbonization policy, increasingly stringent environmental targets, uh, but also consumer pressure. Uh, you see a lot more uh, pressure from uh, Chinese consumers and just expectations for, uh, uh, for foreign as well as Chinese companies uh, to have some sustainability practices in place. So as I said, uh, the rules of the game have changed. The game looks a lot different, uh, but there are still some gains and opportunities uh, even in a much more complex uh, arena. Well, Dr. Shabor, thank you so very much for writing a terrific book. Uh, that all business people should read. Uh, China's Next Act uh, uh, gives us a framework and uh, principles and paradigms and norms uh, that uh, we could all very profitably reflect upon. So let me thank you for your contributions uh, to US-China and not only US-China, but China and the world uh, uh, relations. And I can't wait uh, uh, for your next work uh, and look forward to continuing a discussion with you over time. So thank you to everyone in our audience. We're grateful uh, for your time. And I urge everyone uh, to purchase and read uh, China's next act. Thank you and goodbye.